Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. On today's episode of Leader Up, Leader Up audience out there, we have an absolutely fabulous guest. We have Dr. Raj Iyer, and Dr. Iyer is the Chief Information Officer of the United States Army. And we're going to talk today about digital transformation, Army digital transformation. So, Dr. Iyer, thank you so much for uh, joining us today on Leader Up and giving us your time. Yeah, David, uh, thank you for the opportunity as well, and I look forward to the conversation, and I hope your viewers and your uh, um, uh, your audience enjoy this conversation. Uh, I'm sure that they will, sir, because we're going to talk about some really exciting things that your office has kind of spearheaded over the past couple of years, and and I want to I want to focus our audience uh, on two publications that that we're going to talk about today, and the first is the Army Digital Transformation Strategy, published in October 2021. The second is the Army Digital Human Capital Strategy. And Dr. Iyer, I'd like to start with a quote uh, that that you made in one of those publications, and I'm going to read the quote and uh, ask you just to to explain a little bit more about why, why these things are important. And here's the quote, going digital is a mindset it's a culture change. It's about how we can fundamentally change how we operate as an army through transformative digital technologies, empowering our workforce, and re-engineering our rigid institutional processes to be more agile. And so I'd just like you to elaborate on that quote and just explain maybe some of the points in there that our, that our audience and the rest of the army needs to understand about digital transformation. Yeah, David, great question to start the conversation, and I'm really glad you asked it. I can tell you, uh, you know, when I first came on as a CIO, you know, we were really struggling to identify what our priorities were going to be and how do we align them to Army priorities. And as we started digging into, you know, the current challenges that we were facing as an Army when it came to IT, our networks, our data, we really had to put this in the context of where the Army was headed. And it was very clear that, you know, in previous years, even before I had come on, the Army was already on a path to modernize. And it was then called, you know, Waypoint 2028, and then getting to a fully multi-domain capable Army by 2035. And when we read every tenet, every principle of what multi-domain operations was, it was very clear that it was all fueled by data. And, and again, it, is very, it was very clear that, you know, as we moved away from fighting counterinsurgency to large-scale combat operations, potentially with a technologically sophisticated near-peer adversary, it was very clear that, you know, our, our strategic deterrence was going to be established not through all of the best kinetic efforts and the, and the, and the weapon system platforms we had, but quite frankly, how well we were able to connect them, integrate them, and unify them to enable what we call decision dominance, which is really, you know, for the commanders on the field, how well and how quickly are you able to make decisions with in, in times of uncertainty at the speed of war with potentially li- limited, in some cases, a lot of data, but to be able to come up with the right decision choices at the speed of war. And so, so that was the... That was the guiding objective for why we thought about we, how we needed to reimagine where and how the Army needed to modernize its IT. So when when I did, uh, having come from the private sector, when I looked at that problem statement and I tried to correlate that to you know what I saw in the private sector, uh, to me this was about how so many of the many you know startup companies and even big, larger, well-known established companies had adopted what's called what was called digital transformation to essentially come up with brand new operating models for their businesses. And you know, this is, you know, and, and the, and the, some, some of the examples I can give you are Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft. I mean, you can go on and on. And these these were all companies that completely disrupted the market with a whole new operating model 
where they leverage data in ways that their competitors and their industry typically had not. And I'll give you a really, really simple example. If you take, if you look at Uber, you know, we were all used to flagging down, you know, yellow checker cabs down the street every time we needed to get to point A and point B. But, you know, it, it came, you know, it was only about because of Uber that we realized, hey, wait a minute, if we were able to create a whole new ecosystem of car drivers that are not the traditional taxi cab drivers, but anybody that owned a car, and you had, you know, the, the, your regular consumers, and you put them together on a platform, on a digital platform, where they could see each other in real time, and you're able to track and follow, you know, where they're going, where they're coming from, the pricing, give you options for the types of cars you could select from, what it was going to be, you know, for different times of the day in terms of costs, you know, dynamic pricing based on traffic patterns and availability of cars. You know, it wasn't until Uber that that concept came about. And oh, by the way, all of that was fueled by access to real time data and making that available to this new ecosystem of users and the cloud being the, um, you know, the platform that enabled, you know, this, uh, this tool to work. And quite frankly, you know, we can now go and you know, we all, you know, for us today, we just take it for granted. You know, we, we go to our app and we, you know, we were, you know, we were able to uh, ask for a ride, but that wasn't the case 10 years ago. And, and yet, you know, when we look at how the entire market has been disrupted, um, it is very clear that, you know, there's companies like Uber and others that have really found new ways to operate a business and completely disrupt the market. Now, translate that to the army. The business of the army is war fighting, right? So how do we, how does the United States army need to take advantage of data and disrupt the market, the war fighting market? And for us, in the great power competition against peer adversaries like China, it is absolutely critical that we play the same game and we leverage the same concepts that digital transformation teaches us to be able to establish strategic deterrence. And so that was the kind of founding principles for how the digital transformation strategy came about. Now, all of the technologies, the digital technologies are all enablers. Traditionally, we call them IT. We put them in the bucket of IT. But IT has come a long way and it's really cloud that has really truly changed the whole landscape. It's become much more easier to adopt cloud, to implement cloud and take advantage of it for all kinds of things from just hosting apps to sharing data to artificial intelligence. And so, so these are all game changers. And what we found was whether it was a network, whether it was a cloud, whether it was software systems, cybersecurity, these were all enablers that at the end of the day had to be in support of modernizing the army through digital transformation. But what we also saw was for digital transformation to succeed, it wasn't just about the technology. It was about us having to be, having to really do things in a different way, operate in a different way with leverage, leveraging those digital technologies. And so when we looked at our policies, our processes, whether it's the acquisition process, our talent management process, our requirements process, our budgeting process, they were all very rigid. These institutional processes were very rigid and really were not aligned well to how digital transformation really works, which is all about agility. It's about how quickly we're able to deliver a need, um, uh, you know, meet the needs of a customer or a consumer, leveraging data. And, 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 and oh, by the way, we needed to make sure that while we do this, we also address the people aspects and the talent management aspects of the Army workforce that has to transform you know, to becoming much more digitally native. And so when you roll in the technology aspects, the process and the people aspects, and that's how the Army Digital Transformation Strategy came about. And we called out 13 different lines of effort in three different buckets. Um, and it was a holistic, comprehensive approach to transforming the Army and not just focus on technology. And, and in, the, in the Army Digital Transformation Strategy, that publication... Um, the three objectives or the three buckets, as you refer to them, uh, modernization, readiness, reform, and people and partnerships are those, uh, if I have it right, those three buckets. And just why are those things important? And just elaborate a little bit on maybe some things that have happened over the past uh, two years that help fill those buckets. Yeah. And by the way, the reason why these are the three buckets are because these are the Army's three priorities. 
And now we bucketed them a little differently. The Army has readiness, modernization, and people as the three priorities. And we actually made a conscious determination to actually bring readiness and modernization together because when we looked at how quickly technology was changing, it was important for us to make sure that we had an approach where we were able to take advantage of and leverage digital technologies for current readiness as well as future readiness for modernization, both at the same time. And if we did not do that, we ran the risk of having essentially a dual speed operation where our current operations and current readiness was still based on legacy platforms, legacy systems, and legacy ways of doing things. And then when we looked at the army of 2030, we would have all the futuristic platforms and new ways of doing things. But then at some point between now and the army of 2030, we would have to make a rapid shift from one to the other. And we all know that for our size and complexity of the scale of the army, that is very, very hard to do. So we wanted to make sure we had a good continuum between current readiness and future readiness. And so that was the reason why we combined readiness and modernization into one objective. Now, falling under this objective were all the things we just talked about, accelerating the adoption of cloud. And because why? Because cloud is absolutely critical to digital transformation. I can tell you no company today in the private sector, whether it's Uber or any one of these things we talked about, would even be able to operate their business without cloud. And, and yet, you know, when we looked at multi-domain and we looked at, you know, concepts like join, joint all domain command and control, it's absolutely cloud that's now the unifier for data for us to operate globally at scale. And so how quickly are we able to accelerate cloud? How quickly are we able to, you know, from a data perspective, get to a data-centric army? And hopefully we can talk about this in a, in a little second. How do we ensure that data is used for decision-making at echelon? And, and using, using that as a, as a strategic asset. How do we make sure that any modernization, the effort that we do is looked at it from you know, a cybersecurity lens so that it is secure from the get-go? Because the, more te- the, the greater our technology footprint, the more that we put in place from a technology perspective, it increases what's called the attack surface area from an adversary's perspective. They can now see us more and they have more attack vectors that they could potentially use against us. And so doing this um, you know, in, in, from, a pure, from a cybersecurity perspective and looking at it and integrating it was gonna be important. It was gonna be about how we were gonna change our approach to you know, building new software systems moving forward. Because again, we wanted it to be you know, uh, agile. It's gotta be, you know, where we're focusing on the data and leveraging the data of those applications and then making sure that these can run well in the cloud. So every one of these things, efforts under under readiness and modernization, um, you know, were critical to making sure that we have the right tools and technologies in place. The second bucket around reform is all of the things that we had to do in terms of our institutional processes. And we focused on a couple, you know, just to focus on because we saw those as linchpin uh, key linchpins in, in our success. One is the budgeting process, because as long as our budgeting process is not agile enough to be able to um, uh, to move at the pace of changing technology and quite frankly at the changing you know at the at the speed of war, we were always in this you know in this in this do loop where in requirements were written many years ago and it was budgeted many, many several years ago. And now you finally got the funds, but guess what? Now you're implementing something that was probably scoped with a requirement five or six years ago. And and that is certainly not how agile and digital technologies um, you know, are to be implemented. And so, so we, we wanted to make sure that we had a good hold of how we were doing our budgeting process. The second focus was on talent management, and, and, and we can talk about that as well. But it was important that we upskill our workforce to be able to take advantage um, of, uh, of digital. And finally, the third bucket was on people and partnerships, which really, again, is focused on people and how we, how we you know, change the talent management process. And more importantly, from a partnerships perspective, making sure that we could um, reinvigorate some of our partnerships with our allies and partners around the world, because we know that you know uh, our strength and our deterrence comes when we work closely with our partners. And so, how do we, as even as the Ar- United States Army modernizes through digital transformation, how do we make sure that you know we don't get 
we, we don't get too far ahead of our allies and partners. How do we make sure we bring them in with us and how do we share lessons learned with them so they can also um, you know, engage on this transformation efforts themselves? So again, these are all the key aspects of uh, the holistic approach to digital transformation. And we established the right vision through the strategy. It was very clear upfront that we, you know, we wanted to make sure that this was executable on a two-year plan. We wanted to make sure that these were not incremental changes, but big transformative changes. Many of them are big rocks and things that the army has not been able to solve for a long, long time. But yet, if we didn't solve them, you know, we really would not be able to make the progress that we needed to. And that idea of, uh, I just wanted to go back a little bit to talent management. That's no more complicated than just the idea that what made someone a successful IT specialist a soldier or civilian 10, 15 years ago, those skills may be completely gone. And there, and there are new skills that a person uh, has to learn. And um, so we, we have to figure out ways to keep up with the uh, current industry requirements to make sure that we can leverage the things that we need to leverage. And I wanted, I wanted to go back to uh, something that you talked about earlier, and it's data. And um, in the Army Digital Transformation Strategy, Secretary Warmoth talks uh, about that. And, and the statement is focusing the Army to be more data-centric. And what does that mean to be more data-centric? And, and how well is the Army moving in that direction? Yeah. So, again, as I noted, you know, for the Army to be successful in multi-domain, it is all about the data. And so this is not just on the warfighting end. This is on the institution side, the generating force, the operating force. Everybody has to be able to use data at scale for decision making. And so, so I can give you a few examples here. On the warfighting side, as I noted earlier, this is about how you know, our commanders are able to leverage data for decision making at the tactical edge, whether they're sitting at a division level or core level, or even down to an individual squad platoon level, individual soldier level, you know, the emphasis has been, you know, situational awareness, situational understanding, and uh, and then that is all fueled by data. And so the more data you're able to make available to decision makers, now, you know, it can be fact-based decisions. And I can tell you over the years, you know, the Army has turned uh, what should have really been a science to be, you know, to an art in terms of decision making. And, and that was because we never had all the data we ever needed to be able to do fact-based decisions. And so for us to do multi-domain, especially when we look at integrating a lot of kinetic and non-kinetic effects, it's all about how we enable optionality for the commanders. And obviously, we all know this, you know, no commander wants to use a kinetic option first. They want to be able to leverage non-kinetic options such as, you know, cyber operations, information operations, any one of these things are greater, better, oper- better ways of, um, of, of operating and, and warfighting than actually shooting your first bullet. But yet, when we have to look at all of these from a single pane of glass, we just do not have, we have, in the past, the Army has not had an approach to integrate data across all of these different platforms, sensors, applications, readiness data, logistics data, all kinds of operational data, intelligence data, how do we fuse all this in a way to enable decisions for the commander? And so, so this has been one of our key priorities for the last two years for the Army in terms of how do we get to this kind of common operating picture. And even though we call it as a common operating picture, you know, really what it is, is it's, it's decision analytics. And because our commanders want to be able to do what if decisions, they want to do what if drills, and they want to be able to also you know, uh, look at what options they have in a dynamic threat environment, because when you when you fight at the speed of war, especially when it's at the speed of hypersonics, you don't have the luxury of trying to roll you know uh, roll uh, maps on your table and and manually going through a lot of data trying to figure things out. You got to be able to tip and queue large volumes of data very very quickly, you know, in order to support decision making. So so this has been a top priority from you know from the war fighting side of the house. On the on the generating force um, side of the house, um, you know a, a key priority is how do we measure uh, the health of the army? How do we measure readiness, whether it's tactical readiness or strategic readiness? Um, the army has been maturing to a set of metrics uh, over the last several years 
to be able to measure and see ourselves better. But to be able to see, measure and see ourselves better, we need access to data. And that's got to be good, high quality data that we can trust. And yet without that, you know, there's a lot of manual processes at commands, at units, um, you know, or data that's getting locked in laptops, you know, things that are still paper or digital paper. And, and yet, you know, when it comes to decision making, well, then what we do is, you know, we have analysts and we have other, you know, our, our workforce essentially manually comp- consolidating large volumes of data on PowerPoint slides and presenting them to senior leaders. And I think this is one of the things that, you know, getting to data center cities moving us away from is, you know, these static, um, you know, um, snapshot in time looks into data to something that's much more dynamic, um, fed by real-time data for all kinds of decision-making. And, and that, is a, that is a change uh, that the Army is going through at scale on the warfighting side, on the business side, uh, and at all levels of the Army. And so uh, in the Army Digital Human Capital Strategy, uh, there are six workforce themes, and I'm just going to ask you to address maybe the w- one or two of these that maybe are the most salient or where we've made some good accomplishments over the past couple of years. And the six are, number one, culture, number two, professional development, number three, workforce flexibility, number four, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, Number five, recruiting, hiring, and retention. And number six is developing a tech-savvy workforce. And so I'll just kind of let you pick one or two of those that maybe you're the most excited about or where we've made some good strides and address uh, whichever ones of those uh, that you would like to. Yeah, David, they, they are all important, and they go hand in hand. And I do not believe that we can – you know, get one or two of them done and call it done. And we're going to have to do all of them all the way through the life cycle of the talent management process. And so I will start with the front end of it. I think, you know, we've, we've always been struggling with, you know, trying to find, um, you know, good talent to come work for the Army. And especially now with some of the recruiting challenges that the Army is facing uh, on the uniform side and the competition that we have for, you know, um, a, you know, good top-notch workforce from the private sector, you know, one of the things that we really have to do is make sure that we're maximizing all of the authorities available to us, the maximum flexibility available to us to ensure that we're able to bring in people, you know, with the right benefit level, with the right compensation for the right skill sets. And as long as we are, you know, stuck in a, in a you know, an industrial age era, of talent management systems where, you know, you have to come in at a certain GS level and you have to work your way, your way up over the next 30 years to some, some other point that is completely inconsistent with where we want to be with, with digital. And so I can tell you one of the successes we've had recently is the army's implementation of a new um, hiring process called the cyber accepted service. Uh, This is a whole new um, talent model for the army it's not the GS scale, it's a whole different pay scale where we have much greater flexibility in terms of bringing in people at the right, you know, at the right levels all the way up to GS-15. There are, you know, incentives uh, on top of regular pay to ensure that we're able to retain, you know, the best people that we can. And the ability to pe- for people to move up and get promoted without having to worry about steps and grade levels and time and grade and all of that. And I think this is going to be a huge um, um, a, a huge starting point in terms of making sure that we have uh, a good process in place. We're also doing everything we can to make sure we expose our workforce to all kinds of training opportunities. We really have to upskill the entire workforce to become a little bit more tech savvy, as I noted, because everybody is now, you know, look at look at how we are at home. I mean, we as consumers at home have access to more technology and we use technology in, in ways that we don't when we go to work. And that's because, you know, we have this artificial divide about access to technology and how how much we are enabling those technologies in the hands of the, you know, the the regular office worker. Um, And if we do that well, you know, my intent, my expectation is, my hope is that, you know, we will get our workforce to innovate and find new, new great ways of doing things. But without that, you know, they're still stuck in industrial age processes. And so a huge effort to really get our workforce exposed to new certification, new training, 
you know, we brought on a number of uh, learning management platforms such as Udacity and U Udemy and others where, you know, SkillsBridge, like all of these, you know, are now available to our soldiers and civilians at no cost where they can upskill themselves. We're also looking at opportunities where we can bring, you know, take our best people and then put them in industry for a couple of years where they can gain industry experience and then come back to the army. And so these kinds of rotational opportunities are absolutely critical. It's also important that, you know, when they do come into the army, that, you know, we give them good, exciting work to do. If we're gonna, you know, bring the best technical and software engineers into the army, we want them to do software engineering. So we've had some good success, initial success with some of our um, initiatives like the Army Software Factory that we established as part of Army Futures Command in Austin, where, you know, we're bringing in soldiers and we're teaching them how to code. And at some point, these soldiers will now go back to the army and then become agents of change and then, you know, help build, you know, a bigger, broader workforce uh, of technical experts. But whether it's the software factory or the, uh, the AI training that, you know, we, um, that we, we conduct with Carnegie Mellon, um, there's plenty of opportunities in the army now uh, for people to take advantage of them. And, and when they do that, when they do get trained, we want to make sure that we give them jobs with it actually taking advantage of these skills and continuing to you know, build them. And then we continue to motivate them to stay in the army and we give them more harder, challenging problems to work with. Because the last thing you want to do is not force them to go into a managerial track if they need to be promoted. We, you know, we are now making uh, headway in getting, you know, getting people into non-supervisory technical GS-15 levels where they can stay technical experts and, and be the best they can be without having to be supervisors. So I think across the board, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area, but I think we have started to scratch the surface here and the, and the uh, digital human capital strategy establishes our plan to work the remaining issues. And I'd like to uh, go to a topic, sir, that I've, I've seen emails about, I've heard some discussion about, and it is the bring your own device program and I just would like to ask you to explain what that is and what what that will do for the Army and how close is that to uh, becoming a reality for, for the broad, broad uh, United States Army? Yeah, so it is already here. So we have uh, over 20,000 users uh, who are onboarding um, into the BYOD program right now. And then we expect that next year, um, you know, we will have as many as 800,000 users um, on it, um, you know, in, to enable essentially. And, and again, the reason why we established the program was, you know, when I came with the job right in the middle of COVID, uh, it was very clear that we needed to enhance the user experience of our workforce. And clearly this had morale issues. They had potentially, you know, retention issues. And, you know, when you had people working from home, and they were not in their offices, and yet they were constrained by not having access to their data, you know, it was clearly very, very frustrating to a lot of uh, our workforce in the early days of COVID. So what we've done since then is, you know, we've taken advantage of the cloud to, um, you know, to implement uh, these initiatives like BYOD and virtual desktops. And what this enables them to do is to really bring their own devices, connect to their networks at home and get access to their full desktop as if they were exactly at work. They would have all their files. They would be able to do all of their work um, using their own personal devices. Um, and quite frankly, there's cost savings to be had here as well, because you know, we have you know, even 30, 40% of the workforce that's willing to bring their uh, you know, MacBooks and, and use them to work, you know, for work, which or any other you know, device that they may have, and, and they prefer to use that for work. Um, guess what? This program now a lot enables them to do that, and we have we now need to procure less of them, because these are all you know these services are all delivered from the cloud. Uh, there is no data or software that resides on these laptops, so it's also secure. And what this does is you know it makes it easy for the help desk to support users because there's no you know real laptop to go now you know troubleshoot if there's any issues. They can be remotely um, diagnosed and, and fixed uh, because the services are delivered through the cloud. And so this truly, truly enhances the user experience, especially as we are in a post-pandemic environment and we continue as an army to be in this kind of hybrid uh, remote work environment. And we expect these tools to only just continue to 
uh, enhanced and greater cap- capabilities to be delivered over the next few years. And so, sir, in our final moments, I'd like to talk about your experiences and kind of your service to the United States Army. And I want to start with the fact that you came out of private industry into the United States Army uh, as the CIO, and you were, in fact, you are, in fact, the first civilian to hold that title. And so my question is, your experience has been what in terms of the benefits of coming from private industry and working in the army and being the first uh, army civilian to hold the title that you have so what's that been like and and how has it helped that process for you to have that background and come into the army as the cio yeah first uh a real honor a real privilege to have held this position as the first civilian CIO. When you go back and look at the Army's 247-year history, uh, to be the first civilian to hold this role, um, you know, is is truly, truly, truly um, uh, something that you know I never expected. And uh, and yet, when I look back at the decision I had to make uh, coming into this job, to me it was very clear. You know, when I was being sought uh, for the position. And then former Secretary McCarthy thought that I was the person to do this job. Um, I had I had I had great confidence that I could get the job done. Um, and and quite frankly, I told myself, if I didn't do this, when I'm being called to duty, who would do this? And you know, if if I say no to this, you know, what I, what is that message? What what message am I sending to everybody else? Um, and especially when you look at a time in which the army was going through this massive modernization effort at a time when the army needs the best technical experts that we have in this nation. If we are not here to be part of this, um, I would say that's a, that's a very, very selfish act. And so to me, this is all about giving something back to the nation in some way. And if I was able to make you know, any kind of positive change, leave the army in a much better shape than what I found it, uh, then truly then I've left my legacy behind. And, and from the likes of what I have seen so far and all of the progress that we've made so far, I'm 100% confident that, you know, the, the successes that we've had uh, are enduring and re- irreversible. And quite frankly, we have, at the end of the day, changed the culture across the Army. We have shown the workforce that they can innovate, that they can all be change agents like I was. Coming in from the private sector, the advantage I had was I could come in as a dumb guy and ask all the stupid questions. And I wasn't wedded to any one particular idea. And and that is so important. And you don't have to be an outsider to do that. The message I have sent the workforce is that every one of our members of our workforce should be able to do that. And because right now, the future, you know, the as we transform the army and as we, you know, move to the, you know, the digital workforce of the future, the skills that are going to be absolutely critical are things like problem solving, critical thinking, analytical skill sets, you know, innovation, how to take new technologies and how do you solve problems. I mean, these are the skill sets that, you know, that we're all going to need. And hopefully I have shown them how we can do this. And hopefully I've been a role model uh, for the workforce to emulate um, and and truly, truly, as I noted, uh, proud of the accomplishments, but a tremendous honor to have held the position. And so, Dr. Raj Iyer, the uh, Army's Chief Information Officer, I want to thank you, uh, number one, for your service to the United States Army, uh, and number two, for uh, giving up your time today to talk to our uh, Leader Up audience. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, David, for the opportunity. My pleasure, indeed. And so, Leader Up audience out there, you've just heard from Dr. Raj Iyer, the Army's CIO. What did you hear? What What are you interested in? Uh, how is your uh, digital intelligence? Are you able to use data the way that that's helpful and supportive for your organization? And uh, give that some thoughts and uh, keep in touch with us here at Leader Up. Let us know what kind of things you want to hear about. And join us again for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.